moment of inertia of a disc, and my disc is terribly drawn, and I apologize. I'll try to strive to do better with circles in the future. So I'm going to show you three ways to calculate the moment of inertia of a disc. But before that, let me talk about what is moment of inertia, just really briefly. Uh, so you know we have this equation, F net equals mass times acceleration. And Newton's second law. This is the relationship between um, force and acceleration and this property of mass. It tells you like how difficult it is to change the motion of an object. We call that, you know, you could call it inertia if you want. I don't really care. And then we have, when we talk about rotational objects, we have this. Torque net, about some point O, is equal to, and this is the easy version, there is a more complicated version, uh, I alpha vector, technically. And so this says that the net torque on an object, which I'm not talking about torque right now, I'm just going to let you know, uh, is, tells you how the, how the angular acceleration how the angular velocity changes, which is the angular acceleration. And then we have this property that says how hard it is to change the rotational motion of an object, and we call that the moment of inertia. Now, there is a very complicated version of moment of inertia, but if you have a fixed axis of rotation, then we can define the moment of inertia as the scalar value uh, where we take all the masses of an object and then we uh, multiply it by the distance from the axis squared. So if I take a little piece here, I'll call it dm, and there's some value r from the axis of rotation. This is a disk rotated about the center. Then the moment of inertia of that little piece would be uh, m dm r squared. So it's the mass of that piece times its radius squared. And then I just have to add up all those for con contribution to the whole thing. So this is, since it depends on the distance from the point of rotation, the further you get them from the point of rotation, the greater the moment of inertia. You can have two objects with the same mass, but different moments of inertia. Okay, that's that. I, I assume you already know about moment of inertia. So I'm going to go over three ways to find the moment of inertia of a disk of mass r. This is a solid flat disk uh, with the thickness doesn't matter. It could be a cylinder, actually. Um, mass m radius capital R. Okay, the first way is my favorite way, and that's not to find the moment of inertia of a disk, it's to find the moment of inertia of a ring. So imagine I have this. I have uh, a ring, a thin ring, of radius R and mass M, and I want to find the moment of inertia. So in this case, what I need to do is to uh, break this into tiny little pieces, dm, and then add up the moment of inertia for each piece. So di would be the moment of inertia of each piece. Well, that's going to be its mass, dm, times its distance from the point of rotation squared, which is just going to be r squared. Now to find the total moment of inertia, I can say uh, i is going to be the integral of di, which is going to be the integral of dm. And I need limits of integration. Uh, r squared. And I could integrate over theta. It doesn't really matter because r is, is a constant, right? That's I can pull that out. r squared dm. And dm is the integral over dm. I'm just saying, what's the sum of all the masses around this whole thing? It doesn't, doesn't matter, right? I don't even need to do an integral. I can just say that's just the total mass, m. I mean, this, is, this is a capital M. So it's going to be m r squared. That's the moment of inertia of a ring. But wait, I thought we wanted a disk. We do. We want a disk. Okay, so let's do method one using the moment of inertia of a ring. So let's go back over here. And then here is my disk. And suppose I break this into ring. So here's a ring. And if I find the moment of inertia of that ring, I can break this into rings and add them all up. So I can say, uh, what's the moment of inertia of that ring? di is going to be, and this is a ring of radius lowercase r, <clears throat> and a thickness dr, and a mass dm, which I don't know. So di is, is going to be equal to uh, r squared <clears throat> dm, right? So that's the radius 
of the disc, and that's the mass of the disc. Now, I'm assuming that it's thin enough that I don't have to worry about <clears throat> the change in distance from one side to the other. But if I want to find the total i, I could integrate from r equals 0 to r equals r, r squared dm. But I don't have a, the correct integration variable here, so I need to get this integration variable. So let's take this disk. Let's, first of all, let's assume uniform density. And if that's the case, then the density of the ring is equal to the density of the, of the disk. Okay. Or the ratio of mass per area for the disk and the mass per area for the ring is the same. So what's the area of this ring? Well, again, if I assume that this is really thin, I can break this into a small rectangle of length of a width dr and of a length 2 pi r. Because imagine this is wrapped around. That's the circumference of the circle. So this would say the mass per unit length, I'm going to say dm is the mass of that divided by its area, which is 2 pi r dr, is equal to the total mass, m, over the area of the whole thing, which is pi r squared. So I can solve this for dm, and I get dm equals m over pi r squared times all that, 2 pi r dr. The pi's cancel, not the 2's. So I get 2 m over r squared r dr. That's my dm, not r dr squared, r dr. Now I can plug that in up here, and I get i equals the integral. Let's factor out some of these constants. So I have 2m over r squared. I factor that out from the dm times the integral from r equals 0 to r of uh, r. Then I have r squared, and then I have r dr. So r squared times r is r cubed, and if I integrate r cubed, I get r to the fourth, so r over 4. So this is going to be equal to 2m over r squared times uh, r to the fourth over 4 from 0 to r. So that's going to be 2m r to the fourth, that's a 4, over 4r squared r squareds cancel, 2 cancels, I get 1 half m r squared i disk. Okay, that's one way. That's the way I like to do it because I build up, I do the ring first, and then once you know the, the moment of inertia of a ring, that becomes easier. But what if you don't want to use the moment of inertia of a ring? Well, that's fine, you don't have to. Let's do it the second way. So here I'm going to take my disk. And I'm going to pick a little piece right here. And yes, you can see what I'm doing. So I can pick a small piece dm uh, on here, and I can integrate, do a double integral in polar coordinates. So if, let's define that piece as an angle theta and a distance r. Then I need to know the area of this, because I can, again, say di is going to be the double integral from r equals 0 to r equals r, theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi, uh, r squared dm. That's what I'm going to do. But I need to get dm in terms of theta, d theta, and dr. So if I have an area element, let's say uh, dA in polar coordinates, it's going to be the length of this, which is uh, dr, times the width of that, which is r d theta. So I get r dr d theta. Now I, can, I need to find dm, right? I need dm in terms of that. So again, I can say the area of this piece uh, divided by the mass of that piece divided by its area is the mass of the whole thing divided by its area. And this is, again, of radius big R, mass, capital M. So I can say m over pi r squared, right, that's the, the area of the whole thing, is going to be dm over the area of that, which is r dr d theta. So with that, dm 
is going to be equal to m over pi r squared r dr d theta. And I can put that in up here. So now I have, oh, that's i. i is going to be equal to the double integral of this m over pi r squared uh, times uh, r squared, I'll write it out, r squared times r dr d theta. So let's first do the theta integration. There's only, there's no theta terms in here. So if I integrate over uh, theta, then this just becomes theta from zero to two pi. So this is gonna be equal to, I'm gonna pull that out front, m over pi r squared, r cubed dr, this is from r equals zero to r, and then I have uh, theta from zero to two pi. And so if I evaluate those limits, I just get two pi. So I have two, I'm gonna pull it out front, two pi m, that's r squared, over pi r squared, uh, the integral from zero to r of r cubed dr, the pi's cancel. And then if I integrate this, I get two m over r squared, r to the fourth over four from zero to r, and then I get the same thing I got before, i equals, because then this four and the two cancel, I get one half m r squared. So the reason I don't like this one is because it's a double integral, and I think in the introductory courses, a lot of students may not have done this yet. They may have not done double integrals. They may have not have done uh, integrals in polar coordinates with the area element in polar coordinates. And, and that's just an extra thing that's just confusing to them. Whereas if you do it by the rings, uh, it's not that bad. Now here's my favorite, I'll, I'll be honest, this is my favorite way. I'm gonna go ahead and write it. Monte Carlo. Yes. So let's pick R equals um, one and the mass is equal to one. I need, I need some numbers. So imagine that I have a, a circle and I have just a bunch of points on there. I can find uh, the mass of each piece, dm, let's say there's n equals uh, 100 points. There's 100 points. The mass of each piece I'll call dm. It's just going to be the total mass over n. Now I can find the moment of inertia of that single piece, di, it's going to be equal to the radius of that piece, which I'll call ri squared times dm, and that's that. And then the total is just going to be the sum over i of ri squared dm. So all I need to do is to get a bunch of points spread out over a circle and then just literally add up all their moments of inertia of the individual pieces. The Monte Carlo comes from using random numbers to get these pieces. So how do you distribute uh, points over random space? There's more than one way to distribute these, these points. Um, and I, I just like to do it uh, this Monte Carlo way. So what I'm gonna do is to generate a bunch of points. I'm gonna generate points in a box like this from negative one to one. And that will have, uh, this has a radius of one. And then I'm gonna calculate the, the distance of each point from the origin. And if that point has a distance less than r, then it would be inside of the circle. And I'll keep it. And if it doesn't, I'll throw it away. And at the end of the day, I'll have random points distributed uh, over this circle. And then I can, once I have all those points, I can calculate the moment of inertia of each one and add it up. It's gonna be so fun. And we're gonna do this in Python um, using the random function. So let's just jump right into Python and do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna display it. It's gonna be fun. Uh, and we'll see what it looks like. So, and I will give you the code for this. So switching to Python. So here I've, I've, I'm using GlowScript vPython. Um, this is a web version of Python. Uh, so you don't have to install anything. Um, I'll give you the code for this and you can, you can look at it and edit it as you like. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is to uh, say this, r equals one, 
m equals 1. When we're doing numerical calculations, um, we have to use numbers. And so I'm going to use numbers for both the mass and the radius. I'm not going to get a, an analytical expression for it. Next, I'm going to do this. n equals, let's start with n equals 100, and that's how many pieces we're going to have, and I'm going to uh, change that later. And then I'm going to do this, n equals 0. Now I'm going to show you how I'm going to count to 100. Okay, so I'm just going to say while n less than n, uh, print n, and then I'm going to say n equals n plus 1. So what I do is I, I print the value of n, then I increase the value of n, and then I keep doing that as long as n is less than 100. So let's run that. And so there you go. It goes to 99, but it started at 0, so that is 100 pieces. So that's good. So that's just how we do that. Um, now what I want to do is to make a random sphere uh, between negative 1 and 1. So here's how you do that. So first of all, I'm going to say uh, rtemp. This is just my temporary uh, vector position of the thing. And then I'm going to use this later. So I'm, so I'm doing it. So Python, Glowscript v Python has vector classes built in. Uh, we also have random numbers. So I'm going to say this is equal to uh, r times vector. Now, how do I, there is a, a uh, let me do this. Let me show you this. Print random. So the random function in this case uh, is a number between 0 and 1. So here's 100 numbers between 0 and 1. But I want them between negative 1 and 1. So I could do that by saying 2 times random minus 1. So that's going to be between a highest number of 2 and the lowest number of, of negative 1, right? Because random could be 0. So if I do this, now I get numbers between negative 1 and 1. So what I'm going to do is say uh, r temp equals r. I'm just saying r on the outside so I can, oh, big r, times vector uh, 2 times random minus 1. That's my x coordinate. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my y coordinate and my same thing for my z coordinate. Now I'm going to make a sphere. So WebVPython has these three dimensional spheres you can make. So I'm just going to make a sphere. Sphere. It has a position of r temp. It has a radius of, let's say, r over 100. I don't know if that's going to be too small. And that's fine. So I'm just going to make, a, I'm just going to make 100 spheres uh, in this region. It should be a square. And that's that. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And let's make 1,000. Because if I can do 100, I can do 1,000. And there you go. So, oh, this, I did a cube. I'm sorry. So I don't want that. I want them all into the xy plane, right? So let's, that's fine. So I'm just going to say my z value is 0. Now it's just a, a flat disk. Of a, that's 1,000 points. You can count them if you want. I wouldn't recommend it. It's going to take a while. Okay. <clears throat> now what I want to do is to cut away the ones that aren't part of the circle. So what I'm going to do is this. Uh, if mag r temp. So mag is a built-in glow script function that returns the magnitude of a vector. And so I want to know if the magnitude of that vector is less than 1. So if mag of r temp is less than 1, then make the sphere and add 1 to the counter. Right? So I know that if it doesn't do that, it just goes back to the loop, makes a new random number. Okay, so let's do it now and see what happens. And so now we have, and this is in 3D, there's your disk. See, it's a flat disk. So I have a thousand points. All I need to do is to calculate the moment of inertia of each piece. So let's save this. Uh, Monte, I, I make mistakes all the time. Monte Carlo uh, moment, eye of disk. Let's say eye of disk. I love Monte Carlo, it's so much fun. Save. Um, so I have done things where like I don't, I forget to increase the value of n and it goes on forever. So up here I need to do a couple things. First is dm, that's the mass of each piece, it's going to be the total mass divided by n. I already said that. And then I'm going to say this, i equals zero. So what I'm going to do is to calculate i for each piece and then add it to that. But I need something to start with. I need a moment of inertia to start with. Uh, okay, so if 
once I make these pieces, I actually don't even have to draw the sphere. I like to draw the sphere because it looks cool. And there are a lot of different ways you could do this. I could add them to a list, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to calculate the uh, moment of inertia of each piece. So I'm going to say this, di equals uh, <coughs> mag r temp squared times dm. Right, so mag r temp is the radius. I can't square vectors, but I can take the magnitude and square it. And that's that moment of inertia of that single piece. Now I can add that to the total. So i equals i plus di. And then once I'm done, I'll have my moment of inertia. And let's print that. So once it goes through a thousand pieces, print uh, i equals i. And that has units of, oh, comma, that has units of kilogram meter squared. And let's do this. I theory equals 0.5 times m times r squared. Print that to I theory equals I theory. I like to put my units, kilograms times meters squared. Okay, so theoretically it should be 0.5, right? 0.5 times one times one squared. And I got 0.506, which is not bad. That is not bad, okay? And this is really useful because there's some cases where it's a difficult calculation, difficult integral, but we can uh, use random numbers instead to get that. Let me get uh, change this to say uh, 10,000. What if I do 10,000? There's 10,000 points right there, and I get something that's even closer. But every time I run it, I'm gonna get a slightly different number, right, because it's using random numbers. Okay, so that code, let's change this code back to 1,000. I don't want to share it with you if it says 10,000 and run it. And then that's that. Okay, I'm going to give you the link to that code down below. And hopefully you found that useful. And that's that.